you know, when I was asked to come and give the talk here, I suggested two titles, and uh, one of them was more technical, uh, the other one was more general, and Professor Gantrampas said that it would be better if I talk more generally, since the audience might be heterogeneous. So what I'm going to talk about today is about the connection <coughs> between science and society and whether the public understanding of science is important at all. Uh, how many of you are studying to be engineers? Or how many of you are scientists? Yeah. 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 Engineers are the thing that I'm wonderful. Yeah. Okay. All, engineers, all engineers are scientists. So, uh, despite the fact that sometimes I uh, they say that they are not scientists, that scientists are different from engineers. But the public understanding of science sometimes is that the public doesn't understand science very well. And scientists don't communicate it very well. And this American cartoon sort of summarizes it quite well. This is a husband and wife uh, are sitting at the dinner table, and uh, one says to the other that this is the nicest conversation we've had in this. Let's not spoil it by talking. And if you quiet, don't communicate anything, then maybe you are in fact getting along uh, reasonably well. The American Academy of Arts and Sciences uh, carries like surveys on uh, many such topics, and uh, one of the surveys that they did was to question American adults and American scientists, ask them some questions. Is it safe to eat genetically modified foods? 37% of US adults said it was safe, so the majority felt it was unsafe, whereas 88% of the scientists felt it was safe. So there's a very large difference in perception between uh, the public and the scientists on whether genetically modified foods are safe or not. The use of animals in research is almost two to one. Uh, the general public doesn't favor the use of animals in research, whereas scientists favor the use of animals in research. Is it safe to eat food grown with pesticides? Now, of course, here I think a substantial number of scientists, about 30%, appear to have doubts, and they should have doubts, whereas most ordinary people feel that it's better not to eat anything with pesticides, and one might tend to agree with that. The last one is the most interesting, and that is whether humans have evolved over time. Now it turns out that 98% of scientists, and presumably engineers, uh, feel that humans have evolved over time. And uh, when there's among the general public, there is some doubt. A good majority, 30, a good a substantial minority, 35% uh, don't really agree with the idea that humans have evolved over time. If you go to climate change, which is the subject of great discussion now, only about half the people believe that climate change is due to human activity. Uh, whereas among scientists, more than uh, three quarters, by 80, 90 percent of scientists believe that uh, rising temperatures, rising carbon dioxide levels are correlated and that climate change is a real, really a result of anthropogenic uh, activity. So there are such questions which people have asked. And if you look at the uh, slide that I have now, you will find here is a cartoon, and this one, you have a pesticide uh, resistant crop. A species which can eat it is in the pipeline. So you now have the problem of pesticide resistance, like antibiotic resistance, spreading. <coughs> so when you use a chemical to kill a biological organism, it turns out that after some time, the biological organism becomes resistant to it and learns how to tackle it. Of course, this cartoon is something that you should see. This now is uh, arguably the most powerful man in the world, uh, President Donald Trump, and he doesn't believe in most things. Of course, he doesn't believe in climate change, but neither does he believe in education. <laughs> and he doesn't believe in almost anything that most of us uh, would believe in. And the problem here is that a substantial part 
of the American population would actually tend to increase with Donald Trump. It may not be a majority, but it's a very, very significant minority. So this is uh, somewhat worrying. So I was trained as a chemist, and then uh, I studied chemistry. And then over a period of time, I slowly drifted off into uh, biology. And today, I would call myself uh, as much of a biologist as a chemist. And uh, occasionally, I would even have some pretensions to some other discipline. Because all these disciplines are getting now uh, mixed with one another to take a step. But chemistry is a discipline which Arthur Convert many years ago called the lingua franca of the medical and biological sciences. So you can't do better than Convert here. If you are going to study uh, the biological sciences, or if you're going to study the medical sciences, your foundations in chemistry must be very, very strong. Without chemistry, I don't think one should be studying either of these disciplines. It's important, of course, to know chemistry when you're studying chemistry, but it's even more important to know chemistry when you're studying biology or when you're studying uh, medicine. In America, to get into medical school, the one subject in which you have to get an A grade is uh, chemistry. In India, in order to get into med medical school, you only have to know your friendly neighborhood politician. <laughs> and then you will be able to get into medical school if you have a sufficient amount of uh, money. So this really marks a sharp difference in medical education in the West and medical education in India. Now, a lot of uh, younger people, I talk about senior people, but younger people, how many of you watched the, food, the Cricket World Cup which happened in England uh, uh, some time ago? How many of you watched it? It was wonderful. Because I used to watch it every night. And my wife used to start to, why are you sitting in front of the TV watching this stuff in the night? But if you watch the Cricket World Cup, you would have found that this advertisement keeps coming. We used to keep coming between every over this advertisement. And I used to watch it very carefully. Now this was one young lady selling another young lady what is called puro healthy salt. So the lady would appear at the counter and uh, keep a, bottle, uh, a packet of salt. And the lady behind the counter would say, don't take that salt, it's got all chemicals in it, but take this puro healthy salt, it has no chemicals in it. <laughs> <laughs> so she takes the puro healthy salt, and has no chemicals in it. And then she goes on to say a lot of other things in this ad, if you listen to it carefully. And you know, these, these ads are largely the product sometimes of uh, marketing departments which are often headed by people who have IIT engineering degrees and then have gone to the Indian Institutes of Management and then uh, specialized in marketing and then have ended up in multinational corporations. The government of India has for a long time been uh, putting iodine into salt, iodide, so that we get a little bit of uh, iodine which is necessary as an essential nuclear. So iodization of salt was a major public health initiative in India. But this lady would now tell the lady at the company, tell the customer, that look, your salt has only one mineral, that is iodine, whereas the pure salt now has many minerals, it has as many as 80 minerals, and there are minerals like calcium, magnesium, potassium, zinc, and so on. And then we kept listening to this advertisement that came in here. Look, 2019 has been declared by UNESCO as the International Year of the Periodic Table. And the periodic table has all, all these elements, <laughs> calcium, magnesium, <laughs> and here is this a nice young lady now calling them all minerals. And so the difference between a mineral, between a chemical, etc., all of it has actually sort of disappeared. The cutting perception of chemistry is very poor. So generally you will find cartoons like this. If there's a chemical, it's very bad. So everything has got to be chemical free. This is why you will find Patanjali now selling uh, pro-penis phenide, which is chemical free phenide. So now that is an interesting idea. Uh, uh, they would actually imagine that cow urine, for example, is chemical-free. But it turns out that nothing is chemical-free. 
natural pathways. You can think about it for some time. There's nothing around you which is getting to feel, not even you. <laughs> not even this desk. Not even the sand outside. It's, it's impossible to live in a world which is chemical free. So one shouldn't be afraid of chemicals. But if you ask, which are the two areas of the science, technology, disciplines, which are most popular among politicians, there are two. One is chemistry and the other is mathematics. Because you will find if you read the newspapers, the words chemistry and mathematics are very, very frequently. I'm an avid reader. I read everything. Uh, whether good, bad, doesn't matter, because it's interesting. And then when you read the newspaper, this was the previous Bihar election. Those of you who follow politics will remember that we had this alliance of Mr. Lalu Prasad and Mr. Nitish Kumar, which won the Bihar elections. So, Arun Jaitri, a scholarly commentator on Indian politics then, has said that the Bihar election was about chemistry, not the rhythm. And the newspaper Telegraph said that it's right math and chemistry. <laughs> and Hindu, which is always right on all these issues, said good arithmetic but no chemistry. And surely enough, if you wait a little longer, you will find the equations. <laughs> now you have Mr. Nitish Kumar uh, with another partner running yet another Bihar government. And uh, today, of course, it's not only Bihar, it will be uh, Karnataka, it is Maharashtra, it's Haryana, it's just about the entire country. So politicians have an intuitive idea of arithmetic, mathematics, chemistry. <laughs> and here, it, I will, this is money later, I will call this new chemistry and old mathematics. Because mathematics, as far as the 70s is concerned, is someone should have a majority. So if you add in different ways, if you get a majority, you've got your arithmetic right, but maybe your chemistry may or may not long, last very long. <laughs> now we come a little bit closer to 2019. All kinds of chemistry work here, or did not work here, and there was really arithmetic from chemistry, question asking chemistry. But then we went into another aspect, uh, where politicians begin to hug one another. And in the beginning to hug one another, there was this uh, headline which caught my attention, can Modi and Abe go beyond personal chemistry? <laughs> <laughs> was this hug? Now I want you to look at this very carefully and interpret this. This looks, I don't know, chemistry here looks good. <laughs> one is not very sure, although we've just walked out of the regional uh, cooperation uh, summit. Here, of course, is even another hug. I'm not so sure about the chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, the third one is the chemistry. <laughs> and this one, you are just not sure about chemistry. So by now, every one of you, irrespective of whether you're a scientist, engineer, you're a philosopher, or a common man, you automatically will have an idea of what chemistry is all about. <laughs> We know what chemistry is intuitively. We know what it's going to take because we are careful with our money. And uh, the Prime Minister must always have the last word. And he said, after the 2019 election, the talks had been destroyed, he said, chemistry defeated the <laughs> I have kept this slide very carefully. I made this myself and kept it very carefully. Because you never know when you have to put mathematicians in their place. And when you have to put mathematicians in their place, there is no better way than to quote the practice. <laughs> to let everybody in their place. Now, popular misconceptions about, uh, about science abound in the general public. And we are now in the third week of November. We have to wait for just another six or seven weeks before the next edition of the Indian Science Congress is held. And immediately after the Indian Science Congress is held, for the week after, the newspapers will be full of all the remarkable things that have been discovered in India 3,000 years ago, and all the scientists objecting to whatever was said in the science conference, and you will have uh, a lot of discussion. It will die out the week or so. But our former Minister of State for Human Resource Development did say this in 2018. He said that Charles Darwin would be proved wrong in 20 years. So he's actually looking into the future. 
So he doesn't like evolution. And his main argument against evolution was really this, that if Darwin said in The Descent of Man uh, that there was a connection between apes and the human beings evolved eventually slowly from uh, apes, this didn't sound right. Because he said, nobody has ever made an observation. None of my forefathers, he said, ever saw a monkey turn into a monster. <laughs> and uh, sure enough, uh, nobody had ever seen a monkey turn into a man. But this is not what Darwin really meant, or this is not what Darwin actually said. But what it illustrates is that there is a profound misconception about what biological evolution really is. And therefore, perceptions about science can be wrong in, very, in people who hold high office. It's most disturbing when they hold the office of the Minister of Education. And uh, this, unfortunately, in our country is happening very frequently. But after Mr. Satipal Singh said this, uh, the newspaper cartoonists went to town. So I found that there were cartoons which said, nobody's ever seen a monkey turn into a man. But many people have seen men turn into monkeys. <laughs> and uh, so it uh, a cartoon of uh, people throwing stones or burning buses and uh, so on. But one might actually quote Darwin at this point. Darwin, in The Origin of Species, uh, talks about his general ideas of natural selection and evolution. And he, he's a religious man, a uh, very religious man. He was buried in Westminster Abbey, and he says there is grandeur in this view of life, with its several powers having been originally built by the Creator into a few forms or into one. And that while this planet has gone slightly long according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been on the evolved. Here, what Darwin has done is simply transfer the problem of evolution of primordial cells is transferred into the creator. But then he says, from this point onwards, biological evolution, chemical evolution, biological evolution, speciation, all of these have subsequently <coughs> taken over. Now I will speak a little bit to biology and its connections to chemistry. There are three pillars of modern biology. What are the these three pillars of modern biology are Darwinian ideas of evolution. The other are the Mendelian ideas on genetics. And how uh, is genetics and evolution now connected to one another? Genetics and evolution are connected to one another through chemistry. Biology is really influenced by all the chemistry that happens. But chemical information is really encoded in DNA. And Oswald Avery's discovery of DNA as a genetic material in 1944, and the Watson Crick uh, establishment of the DNA double helix in 1953, are the two foundational pillars which link chemistry to biology. Because once you have mutations, which are actually chemical changes in DNA, those now can be transferred to chemical changes in proteins and other molecules, and therefore genetics and chemistry are then linked to evolution. Now, most of you would have, even if you've never studied biology, everybody knows biology. Because you are a biological organism, and your biology is reminding you of something or the other of all the time. It also turns out that very young people don't worry about this too much. But beyond a certain age, everybody begins to worry about biology and medicine. Because they can feel their biology failing. The knee begins to pain. Uh, the brain begins to forget, and uh, you begin to feel various things, and you realize something's going wrong, and then you worry what's the origin of things which are going wrong. You also worry at the very end, why can't you live forever? Why do organisms eventually have to die? And uh, genetics is again something that everybody knows. I don't know how many of you have seen this, but if you've lived long enough, you'll have seen it many times. You know, you, uh, a baby is just born, and everybody will be visiting their parents, and the proud parents will be showing the baby to everyone. And all those who like the father will say, looks just like the father, and all those who like the mother say, looks just like the mother. But if you have a neutral observer standing there, you will find that it looks like neither of them. 
And then you realize that that development and the expression of genes, etc., which give you phenotypic characteristics, take place over a period of time. And this happens over the natural course of development. And that is where uh, an understanding of biology is sometimes uh, very, very important. <laughs> Now, of course, we come to the present. Now we have a real problem. We now have a minister now, the cabinet minister for human resource development, and you will undoubtedly welcome him to your campus one day. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> uh, he was a, uh, a member of parliament, and I'm going to come back to parliament discussions in the evening. He was a member of parliament, and in 2014, uh, in a debate on the School of Planning and Architecture Bill, which is actually a bill which is connected with a science engineering institution, he actually said science is a dwarf in front of astrology. Astrology is the biggest science, it is in fact above science, we should promote. And uh, a statement like this is very worrying. The press, of course, then says the new education minister's remarks on science should not enter our books. But uh, this is a cautionary statement which has been made. But one must be very cautious when you hear uh, uh, statements uh, like this. But politicians are not the only ones. Uh, there are judges now. Now, in India, everything is decided by judges. And uh, once the judges have pronounced a verdict, uh, you've got to accept it. Uh, you can't say anything unless you want to go to jail on contempt of court charges or something like that. This. And here is a judge of the Rajasthan High Court who says that uh, the PN gets pregnant drinking the tears of the people. Now, this, of course, is a profound uh, misunderstanding of uh, how animal reproduction actually happens. And uh, uh, the press again, of course, said uh, Rajasthan High Court judge says that peacocks don't have sex. How do you think peacocks reproduce? Now, this is a good question. There are many bizarre biological organisms, organisms which you will find under the sea and so on. You do ask this question, how do they reproduce? Sometimes there is reproduction which is external. There are different ways in which biology has, but one must have an understanding of these. But the most recent one is the one which alarmed me most, and this was a chief minister now. So it doesn't matter whether you're a judge, chief minister, central minister, it really doesn't matter. This is why the understanding of science in a country like ours is so important. He said that cows exhale oxygen. Now this would be wonderful because the compromise immediately suggested that if cows exhale oxygen, then you can have an ICU at home. <laughs> there you are. And you have an oxygen cylinder straight away moved up to the floor and then you can sit there. Now, respiration is very really central to understanding a great deal of cellular processes. And uh, one might ask the question, how do the plants do, what do animals do, and so on. Without oxygen, we would really not uh, uh, be around much, except the big house from Jawaharlal Nehru introduced in his discovery of India in 1946 this phrase, the critical depth of science. And this is the phrase that he took and later on converted it into a shorter phrase, scientific temper, which then found its way into the Indian constitution. Now, of course, Nehru today is a much revived figure. But this is a Nehruvian phrase, and this Nehruvian phrase is right there that this temple of science must be promoted uh, everywhere. But Mr. Rajpai actually said this rather well in an address to the Science Congress. He said we must give science to the people, and then he said everybody's fond of quoting Pandit Nehru's famous words. Scientists are a minority in league with the future. I think Rajpai paid a great tribute to the scientists assembled at the Indian Science Congress whether they deserved it or not, by saying this. As there are some scientists who are a minority in league with the future. There are a large number of scientists who are a majority who are not in league with the future. But he says, this is true. But let us also remember that a bright future can be realized 
only when science is in league with the majority of our society. One cannot follow with this statement at all. What he said here is absolutely true. So here, then, in fact, is uh, the integration of both the ideas which Nehru introduced and the ideas which Rothschild further uh, propagated, that there is a connection between science and society, and this connection between science and society is something that needs to be uh, actually explored. Are we the only people who think about this? Certainly not. In fact, these things have been taught about by other people a long time ago. In 1959, at Cambridge University, uh, the English novelist C.P. Snow delivered a famous set of lectures known as the Reed Lectures. And the Reed Lectures were titled The Two Cultures. And he was actually talking about the growing divide between the sciences on the one hand and the humanities on the other, even in a university as venerable and as advanced as Cambridge University. Because he said that in the tables, in the dining halls of Cambridge, he could clearly see that the scientists had congregated to one side and the people in the humanities had congregated to the other. The reason was that in the 1940s, science was at its peak. In the 1940s and 1950s, physicists literally ruled the world. Uh, uh, the water revolution had taken place, the revolution in atomic physics had taken place, the bomb was in place, everything had been understood in physics, the physicists ruled. Really. And therefore, everybody else who was in the humanities was on the back foot. But later, after the Second World War, as one went on into the 50s, Britain was now no longer the power that it had been. And so Snow reflected on this. He said that the British position is precarious. And he says this is the result of history and accident and isn't to be laid to the blame of any Englishman now living. Then he says something very interesting if you might think about it. He says, and he means British, he says, if our ancestors had invested talent in the Industrial Revolution instead of the Indian Empire, we might be more soundly based now, but they didn't. So he actually argues that the best minds in England, the most enthusiastic young people in England, was sent to rule the Indian Empire. They were not retained in England and put to work on all the technological advances which were to come, the scientific and technological advances, immediately after the Industrial Revolution. Many of you are engineers, and you will immediately realize that well, nothing like the Industrial Revolution uh, to really transform the world. But Snow says something else important here, which I think in India is important for us to recognize. He says if scientists have the future in their bones, then the traditional culture responds by wishing the future did not exist. And this is unfortunately the problem in India today. When we look back at the past, we should look back at the past. But we shouldn't look back at the past at the expense of the future that one can envision. One must envision the future and ask whether you can learn any lessons from the past. I'll come back to biology and evolution. Is there a conflict between biology, evolution, and religious belief? This was addressed very well by the evolutionist Dostoevsky, who wrote this in, what, in a book called, in a journal called the American Biology Te Teacher. He said that evolutionary doctrine clashed with religious faith. He says it does not. It is a blunder to mistake the holy scriptures for elementary textbook of astronomy, geology, biology, and anthropology. Only if symbols are construed to mean what they are not intended to mean, can they arise imaginary and solid. Until Mr. Sakripal Singh raised this about evolution, there was no problem really in the, between Hinduism and the Darwinian evolution. There was only a problem between Christianity and Darwinian evolution. So this is something that we must uh, think about a little bit when one thinks about science. Because the public very often is religious, scientists are also religious, and therefore one asks this question very quickly. Now, in India itself, the public perception of science is very important. There are many issues for public debate. 
Now, for example, this bill has now been passed. The National Medical Commission bill was debated quite uh, extensively over the previous year. Now, this bill had a very, very interesting uh, clause. Because we have a shortage of doctors, what this bill suggested was that anybody who's graduated with a degree in Ayurveda or homeopathy could now be put through a strong, a short bridging course of six months, and after that, they could be authorized to prescribe allopathic drugs. The medical community protested vigorously that the, they should not be allowed to write prescriptions of allopathic drugs without having gone through the full medical course. But what struck me most in this was the profound misunderstanding in the, in the bill itself as it was drafted. Homeopathy is not even an Indian invention. Homeopathy is imported from Germany. It was, it came from Manama. And the principles on which homeopathy is based are completely contrary to the principles of what modern pharmacology is based. And therefore one should not couple this. Maybe homeopathy works for the believer. Uh, you can describe it. But the idea of giving someone who's trained in homeopathy the option of prescribing allopathic drugs does not appear to be right at all. Today, our medical practitioners sometimes do not know uh, properly the targets and side effects of the drugs that they prescribe. Because pharmacology is not an important subject in uh, medical school. So one should be worried about bills which are passed. You will find, for example, in today's newspaper, as Parliament begins, they will say that they have an agenda to make it the most productive session of Parliament, and this means passing bill after bill without any discussion whatsoever. If those bills involve science, they must be discussed. Otherwise, we will have a law, and once we have a law, even if it is wrong, you have to stick by it. And this is a danger. Clearance of genetically modified crops. This is again a subject for public debate. Safety, productivity, or resistance. Clinical trials between vaccines. There are problems of ethics, efficacy, toxicity, where poor populations are used as guinea pigs in clinical trials. But the urge to do clinical trials is driven by powerful multinational pharmaceutical interests. So unless there is legislative protection, this will not work. But there is hardly any time to think about these things. We celebrate two days in India. We are very good at celebration. Uh, we celebrate uh, the Raman effect on the 28th of February as National Science Day, and we celebrate the Pokhran explosions of May 11th uh, as National Technology Day. So you can clearly see the difference between science and technology. Uh, uh, science appears to be something which is shown you an effect, uh, may be useful, may not be useful. Technology, on the other hand, seems to have done something extraordinarily useful immediately. It allows you to blow up your neighbors and uh, sometimes maybe even blow yourselves up. Uh, this is the Raman effect as it appeared on the cover of science in uh, 1930 in Scientific American. That's an American scientist demonstrating the Raman effect. And I asked this question how did Raman actually come up or think about the Raman effect? Raman was at that time mostly interested uh, in what the color of what was the color of the sea. Raleigh had said that it was a reflection of the sky in the sea, but it didn't seem quite right because it looks different. And therefore Raman began to study light scattering. And he scattered light from uh, organic uh, liquids, and then he observed that the scattered light had a different frequency uh, from the uh, incident light. And this little bit of frequency of uh, energy had gone away to excite molecules from lower vibrational states to higher vibrational states. It was a form of vibrational spectroscopy that he actually discovered. Very important because at that time, this also was an experimental proof of quantum theory. And in addition to that, it provided you a method uh, to study matter. Today, if you take down a spectroscopy, it's being used for all things. It's being used in medicine. Uh, it is being used. Uh, it's being used, for example, in this discussion of faith, whether the shroud of Turin has the blood of Jesus Christ. So the blood of Turin, uh, the shroud of Turin has somebody's blood on it. Is it the blood of Jesus Christ? 
The only way to find out is it the first one to find out is it blood at all. And after you find out blood, if it's blood at all, you have to date it. And then you have to date it and take it back 2,000 years. We find articles like this. And today you can look upwards to the universe also and look at your own signals uh, which come from molecules uh, over there. So this tells you, it actually answers one question which, which one might ask. Is basic scientific research, can it lead to useful technology? Raman would have never imagined that uh, Raman's capital is going to be used in airport scanners uh, for finding explosives. I, he would be surprised. Raman would also not have imagined that his method would become so powerful because he could not have envisioned the development of the laser. And the development of the laser, the miniaturization of the laser, these were all things which came very much later. So sometimes the basic advance leads to useful technologies but many years later. I would ask a different question. Can new technologies emerge in an environment that does not support science? Increasingly, our environment is becoming an environment which is not very supportive of science. Sometimes even the scientists who advise government are not very supportive of science because they are in fact echoing what the political masters actually say. And therefore, they say what needs to be uh, said in that environment. So this is a danger. But the path between science, engineering, and technology is not a linear one. It can, in fact, meander in many ways. And one needs to look at the successes of the past to find out how to exploit new discoveries which are coming. And I want to discuss three words, discovery, invention, and innovation. Uh, most of you who are young have always heard the word innovation. People like me never heard the word innovation 20 years ago. I was well past middle age uh, by the time I heard the word innovation because it wasn't a word which was being used commonly. We knew discovery and invention. We knew that Fleming discovered the discipline. Discovery happened by accident. We knew that Edison had invented uh, the light bulb. He illuminated our lives. With Einstein, we were never sure what he did. What was relativity? Maybe it was an invention of the human mind. That is a subject for a philosopher. But innovation came much later. Amazon, the retail store, everything, all of that is innovation. The IT industry, the services industry was innovation. But innovative in many ways. It realizes what the West wanted, it realizes, it realized what India's strengths were, and it put the two together, and the services industry uh, really grew. But when you think about this, you might ask, what are the ways of doing science? How is science done? You have to go back. If you go back in time, science is done by observation and classification. You just see, observe, classify, and then you come to some conclusion on what, you, what your observations are. The 19th century saw the most, two most dramatic examples of this approach. Uh, Darwin's ideas of natural selection, which drew purely out of biological and natural observation, and Mendeleev's periodic table which we are celebrating this year, which grew completely out of observations, classifying the elements, putting them together, asking how can they be classified, putting empty spaces in the periodic table, allowing the discovery of the new elements. Pasteur, in the middle of the 19th century, around the same time that these things were happening, you can see I put it in there. History is very important. History is important in science. History is important in everyday life. It is because most of us don't worry about our own history, including our history after independence, that you have the situation you are in today. And 20 years later, we have to worry about what happened in the last 20 years or so. Pasteur introduced the idea of doing experiments in observe. So he experiments could be done, and then if you do an experiment, you observe, find out what happened. You do more experiments, you make more observations. And from those observations, you put them together and come to some conclusion. I'm sure you don't have, uh, he also introduced this chance favors the prepared mind. That I like. That means if you're doing something all the time, your chances of finding something are 
wall. If you're sitting uh, in a chair doing nothing, or sitting in front of the computer looking at Facebook or Twitter, uh, you're unlikely to find it. But if you're in the lab messing around and mixing something or the other, you might actually be distracted. And therefore, there's a great case for doing this better. Does telepathy have traffic jams? Yes, sir. Yes. Wonderful. If it comes from Bangalore, I would call Bangalore the world capital for traffic jams. <laughs> so it's only got jammed everywhere. And I found in Chennai, Adela, there's a place where there's always a traffic jam. And so I think a very innovative entrepreneur has put a hotel there which he calls Hotel Traffic Jam. <laughs> so you can go in, have a plate of Italy, come down, uh, then the traffic will still be moving. So he attacks customers. So, but you might ask yourself a question, which was the first one-way street in the world? Or where, because of the traffic jam, a street is declared one way. And that street is the street in front of the Royal Institution in London. And the street in front of the Royal Institution in London the Royal Institution in London is the place where in this wonderful old hall with an old desk, Humphrey, Farrah, uh, Humphrey Davy began uh, demonstrating experiments, scientific experiments, so that people could come and see those experiments. And Humphrey Davy's greatest discovery was Michael Faraday, who was his assistant. And Michael Faraday then began doing demonstrations there. And he would do the most wonderful demonstrations. His most famous demonstration is the demonstration of electromagnetic induction. And there, if you had a current flowing in a circular coil, it generated a magnetic field perpendicular. If you had a rotating magnet, it would set up a current uh, coil. So he demonstrated the connection between electricity and magnetism. He also did chemistry experiments, which are always interesting, because something you catch fire, but uh, you have your ink and everything. Who came to see him today? And Michael Faraday. It was all the Victorian ladies who needed entertainment. There was not much entertainment in Victorian London. And so they would come in their horse-drawn carriages. Because Victorian ladies would be dressed in all that long finery. They would not walk. So the carriages would drop them. They would go straight in and watch these experiments being done. So the carriages would be parked outside in the street in front of the Royal Institution. And the street would soon be jammed. Nobody else can go there. So the mayor of London then declared the street in the front of the Royal Institution uh, as a one-way street. So the one-way street was born. Science created the first traffic jam in the world. <laughs> and it created the first traffic jam in the world by Michael Faraday demonstrating experiments. It was a wonderful experiment. There's this old story about Faraday's electromagnetic induction. When he was again asked to make down, so what's the use of this? Lord North, who was then the Chancellor of the Exchequer, <coughs> asked him of what possible use can this be? And uh, there are two answers that he's reported to have given. I don't know whether they are true, but you will find them in the literature. The first one was he asked the Minister of what use is a newborn baby. And uh, this is true. We don't know what a newborn baby is going to grow up or what they're going to do. The second, he said, my Lord, you might one day tax him. That turned out to be correct because today we are taxed quite heavily for all the electricity that is produced. But the connection between electricity and magnetism now required that these be unified. And the first grand unification in physics really was due to Maxwell, who unified electricity and magnetism. And uh, Maxwell's ideas on uh, electricity and magnetism and putting them together automatically led to something else. Uh, Light came, more or less, the velocity of light came out of it, and therefore electromagnetic radiation was born with Maxwell. And once we know that light is electromagnetic radiation, there are so many other applications that then came, uh, came out uh, afterwards. The other thing are the ways you might also think sometimes. Faraday did experiment, Maxwell thought about these experiments, but there are others who just think about observations that you see. Boltzmann worried about only one thing. He worried about why objects were hot. And uh, you know when they're hot. Everybody knows when they're hot. He worried about why is it hot. And then, of course, he decided that this was due to the motion of atoms. At the time when he decided that it was due to the motion of atoms, 
atoms were not really accepted by any physicist at that time. The chemists were talking about atoms at that time a little bit, but no physicist accepted the idea of atoms. Boltzmann's entropy really comes from this random motion of atoms, which, uh, as they get heated, they move more and more, more disorganized. And Boltzmann's grade, of course, has his famous equation on it in here. But if you haven't seen this, you must. This is Jacob Rodowski's Ascent of Man. This was a BBC series which came many years ago, but it later came out as a book which is now available. But Bronowski was a scientist, Bronowski was a philosopher, and Bronowski asked the question. This is a very interesting title. Bronowski's uh, thing, which is mostly on Western civilization and the march of Western science, is called The Ascent of Man. Uh, Darwin's book is called The Descent of Man. So you can see now, I'm going to end at the end with a reference to this. The Descent of Man on the one hand, The Ascent of Man on the other, uh, with science. But Bronowski pays a major tribute to both, where he says that to whom more than anyone else we owe the fact that the atom, the world within the world, is as real to us now as our own world. And Boltzmann committed suicide. Boltzmann committed suicide just on the threshold of the revolution in atomic physics, which had already started, but he did not know. If he'd lived a little longer, he would have found that he'd been vindicated but he was depressed because nobody took the idea of uh, Boltzmann's atomic uh, hypothesis uh, correctly. And Boltzmann really said this, that it is the atoms that assume a more disorderly state, and entropy is a measure of that disorder. Today we will use the word entropy very freely. Later on, when Claude Shannon wrote his famous paper on information theory, you will find that entropy is a word which is used in information theory. I showed this article at the beginning of this year in Scientific American. You will realize by now that uh, retired professors uh, have a lot of time on their hands uh, so they can read. But I would also like to suggest that so do a lot of functioning professors and also functioning students who also have a lot of time on their hands. They might just as well read. This article will be interesting. We call something the science tool. That is, what does science rest? Science rests, I have just made this, you know, I learned uh, PowerPoint after my retirement. And uh, <laughs> since I learned PowerPoint after my retirement, I'm very proud of showing this off to my colleagues, who are always surprised, how did you make these slides? Then when I tell them I made the board by myself, they're very unhappy. Uh, because uh, most of my colleagues don't know how to do it. And they ask their students and postdocs to uh, do it for them. But uh, he says there are three legs on which the student has data, theory, and communication. And this is very important. Today we've got a huge amount of data in biology. We have a huge amount of data in economics. We have a huge amount of data in many disciplines. So science needs to account for that data. If you can't account for that data unless you have a theory, and you must not have a theory. See, Maxwell worked with Faraday's observations. So it is important to connect uh, theory and experiment, theory and data today. Communication is very, very important, because unless science is communicated uh, properly, it will not propagate. I just put at the... Uh, uh, corners of uh, this, the scientists whom I felt uh, really influenced uh, a great deal of thinking. You could put others. But as far as making observations are concerned, I only mention two whom I don't have on this slide. The first is Galileo. Because you know, once you have a telescope and you look skyward, you see so many things that you didn't see with the naked eye that opens up an entirely new discipline. The other was Nuremberg, who made the microscope. So you take the microscope and you put a little bit of telepathy water, you saw yesterday's newspaper about all the unsortable water, you see all those little things moving there. That tells you there is life which you can't see with your eyes, and therefore you discover a microbiology. So on the one hand cosmology, on the other hand microbiology, you can't get grander than this. But you need tools of observation. 
the telescope and the microscope revolutionized operation. But data, data is very important. Now, of course, we have India's GDP. Now, the exact figure for India's GDP, nobody knows. It's like this proverbial <laughs> And all the economic advisors to the Ministry of Finance have one number which they calculate while they're in Delhi. And then the moment they go to Harvard, they calculate another number. And they say all the methods of calculation are wrong. So now we're going to see this happen again and again. And the reason is that the calculation now involves many, many parameters. It's rather like the NIRF rankings, which uh, all the uh, uh, directors must be so much worried about. You have multiple parameters, and you would actually uh, fiddle around and uh, fix all these parameters. But sometimes it's interesting to read the press, and you can also get an idea of where people are sitting on the fence and not taking a position. The Hindu business line doesn't really take a position. It says it is possible that two contrary factors are at work in the economy. The first impacting the nominal GDP and the second the real GDP. <laughs> this really means nothing. <laughs> and this is like uh, any of you also do this all the time right there. In optimizing some things, huh? I do write an equation which will have a number of adjustable parameters. <coughs> and once you've got enough adjustable parameters, you can fit just about anything. Yeah. And uh, then no real meaning of understanding. So statistics and uh, must be a subject which is widely taught, widely understood, because otherwise we wouldn't be in trouble. Mark Twain, of course, attributed this remark to Dishay, but there's still some debate on that. In a statement, he said there are three kinds of lies. Lies, damn lies, and statistics. <laughs> and uh, the statisticians don't like this because I found a paper which is called Truth, Damn Truth, and Statistics in the Journal of Statistics Education. <laughs> so statisticians are pushing back on this. I don't know whether statistics is a subject which is taught here. Yes, yes, yes. It is. If it is, then you might discuss both uh, the Mark Twain statement and the paper whose reference is there uh, over here. But here's the discovery. I'm going to show you uh, discovery. This is Rogers' discovery of x -rays. This is an interesting discovery because he was working with tackle rays, and then he had this photographic uh, plate some distance away, and he found an impression on this fluorescent. And once you find an impression, you knew there's something coming out, invisible, which is why they were called X-rays, because they didn't have a name. And uh, they were somehow creating an image on the plane. So he called his wife into the room and asked her to put a hand over this. He could have done it himself. But uh, <laughs> he was a cautious man. And he asked his wife. And I think this is something that any good husband would do. <laughs> Let the wife take the uh, uh, risk. And this image is there. Now, Grotzen's wife immediately saw the image. And you might ask, when she saw the image, uh, what would have been her reaction? <laughs> she said, I have seen death. And I think that's a wonderful reaction, because she has actually seen death, because that's what skeletons are. Uh, of the dead, when you see the skeleton image. In fact, if you go into any medical college, it's interesting. Why do they enter the medical college? On one side, they love skeletons. On the other side, they have all their own principles. <laughs> and uh, uh, you can see that there is actually a connection. And whether there was any meaning in what you did, I do not. But this was Lanshan's discovery. The physicists didn't think much of this discovery. But the medical professionals immediately recognized that here was a method. And uh, radiology was born uh, with that photograph. But radiology has had only one other advance. And this advance is one to which I was a witness. And I was a graduate student. And I just joined for PhD. And I've been given the task of learning the subject of nuclear magnetic resonance, which is being applied in chemistry. And I was asked whether this method could be applied to biological problems. 
I knew nothing about the method. I was young, uh, still learning. And uh, we used to have lunchtime seminars. And in a lunchtime seminar, my supervisor came in and he said he was going to describe an experiment which a colleague had done. And he said this colleague had been in our very laboratory some time before, but he'd now become an assistant professor or associate professor at another university. And he'd done this experiment. What was the experiment? He had taken two glass tubes, uh, two concentric tubes filled with water, and he wanted to make an image of these tubes by measuring the nuclear resonance of water, that is the protons in water, or the NMR signal of water. And he was doing this by using magnetic field gradients, which he believed would now create sections across the image, and he would be able to develop an imaging method, and that is the first image that he obtained. And my professor came in and told me all this. They were senior students. Even in those days, there were eight-year PhD students and first-year PhD students uh, sitting at the lunch table. And uh, I thought that the eight-year PhD students would know more than me, so uh, they would think, they would explain later on what this was all about. But none of us could understand what it was. And at the end of it, we came to one conclusion only. And we are not the general public. We are uh, students of science. Would this method have any use or not? He said it's absolutely crazy because if you want to see two glass tubes of water, all you need to do is to know. <laughs> Why do you need to do all of this to come to this conclusion that there are two concentric tubes of water? In fact, even Paul Mortimer, who did this experiment, at that time didn't have a good name. He called it a zoomatogram, and he uh, it was a terrible name, which uh, later on was removed. It became the first experiment in magnetic resonance image. And at the time when it was given a name, the platform was removed, it was called nuclear magnetic resonance image. But in America, you can't use the word nuclear. We use the word nuclear, nobody would go anywhere near the next So nuclear is quietly dropped. So magnetic resonance imaging then became the second major advance in radiology in the 20th century. The 20th century began with X-rays and the 20th century ended with magnetic resonance imaging. Today, both of them are what we have in every day of the But the perceptions of science can be quite different. In the year 2000, which is now a long time ago, everybody was asking this question, what happened in the previous 100 years? What happened in the previous 1,000 years? Uh, which was dramatic. So, Nature had commissioned a series of essays on what was the most important discovery, scientific discovery, of the 20th century. And uh, this is attracted my attention the most. And this was, I'll show you what it was, it was entitled Detonator of the Population Explosion. And the scientific advance which uh, was highlighted in this one page essay was the harbor box synthesis of ammonia. I don't know how many of you have studied the harbor box synthesis of ammonia. I studied it in college and hated it. Because it's the most dull thing that you can study, high pressure, high temperature, catalyst. They teach you uh, Le Chatelier's principle, the law of mass action, all kinds of things with the ammonia synthesis, which you don't want to know at all. But why was the ammonia synthesis so important? The ammonia synthesis was important because it led to the industrial synthesis of urea. And urea was the fertilizer. And until the ammonia synthesis was done and urea became available, famines ruled the world. In India, the last famine is one which I don't think uh, most of you would not have had a personal uh, experience of this. But the last famine that happened in India, real true famine, was in 1965. I was a BSc student in Pune, and at that time, one of our Prime Ministers, Nan Bahadur Shastri, went on to the radio to say that everybody should not eat on one day uh, to save food. And so all our messes used to be close, and we were all young, uh, we were teenagers, we would feel hungry all the time, and uh, we did not know what was happening. But the famines were removed once fertilizers became widely available, and fertilizers <coughs> entered agriculture. So this was really the detonation of the population explosion. Because before that, more people died of hunger than of anything else all over the world, in Africa, in India, in many other parts of the world. 
So it is a remarkable scientific advance. Until I read this essay, I would not have put the ammonia synthesis. But after I read this essay, I would say if anything has contributed to society, to human society, it's the ammonia synthesis in the 20th century. One would rank it even higher than the DNA double helix or uh, relativity or any of these things because it had a totally practical application. Today, of course, we have other problems. Canada's synthesis of the plastics and the polymers today has become a problem. But eventually the solution to this kind of problem will also come only when scientists are able to say that more research must be done to take care of this. And papers have already begun appearing in the literature on uh, how to do this uh, using engineered uh, esterases which can come from biology. And eventually I think we might have practical ways of disposing of all of this. We need those cares which are used in all our devices like the uh, cell phone and all, so that they can be recycled and used again. Otherwise, we will run out of the elements after some time. So there are problems here, but these are scientific problems that can be solved. Is it important now for uh, everybody to know a little bit of science? My suggestion is it's very important for everybody to know a little bit of science. Most importantly, it's important for politicians to know a little bit of science and for the judiciary to know a little bit of science. And I'll just give you one example of an intersection between science, medicine, and law. I prepared this slide only to show one thing because I've been invited to a law college to uh, speak to law students, so I thought I must make this. Because, you know, scientists uh, look like this, uh, physicians look like this. Our lawyers look like this. <laughs> They're generally throwing stones, burning cars, uh, demonstrating outside high courts, uh, doing all that kind of thing. And if you read the newspapers carefully, you will find that there is a higher education bill before Parliament which will come in the session. This higher education bill is going to affect your institutions. But you will find that very cleverly, the Bar Council of India has put legal education outside the purview of this kind of reform. So legal education is really controlled by the Bar Council. Even the Medical Council has been taken away, its powers have been taken away by the government, but not that of the Bar Council of India. This is because most politicians have had a training in law and they have a training in doing this kind of thing. And uh, therefore, they know that uh, bad education is the key uh, to retaining power. <coughs> now here is a famous judgment of the Bombay Typo, which said that steam is not a chemical. Now I don't know how many of you agree with this judgment, <laughs> but uh, the Bombay High Court certainly said steam is not a chemical, but it was for the reason of tax. And they didn't even justify it. I think they understood that they were going against chemistry, but they said this. But after that, the Royal Society of Chemistry offered a prize of one million pounds to anybody who will give them a material which is chemical free. They haven't yet lost this one million. So you can still collect it yeah. if you can, uh, if you do find a material which is chemical free. But this is the famous case. This is the case of an anti-cancer drug, which was uh, under a patent fight after India's patent laws had been passed by Parliament, cost one lakh and twenty thousand per month. The generic produced by an Indian company, eight thousand per month. But once this generic came into the Indian market, uh, the Novartis filed a case, uh, first in the Madras High Court, and later this case went to the Supreme Court for a decision. This drug, of course, is based on wonderful science which has been done in an academic institution and later exploited uh, uh, in a company. But the Supreme Court passed a judgment. And the Supreme Court in this judgment actually threw out the statement and said the cheaper version should in fact now be uh, should now be so. And uh, They passed this judgment, unfortunately I wrote the date because it was 1st April 2013. Because they could have waited to the 2nd of April at least after they passed the judgment. But this is probably the most scientific judgment of the Supreme Court. Probably has maybe 35 or 40 pages so you can read. 
Today, you see, if they pass a judgment, it is 1,000 pages. And uh, sometimes I believe that the courts adopt the strategy uh, which uh, Bernard Shaw once uh, said. You know, he wrote a very long letter to a friend. And then he started off by saying, I'm going to write a very long letter to you because I don't have time to write a short letter. <laughs> and, uh, it is difficult to write something short. It's easy to just put everything that you can um, into a paper. But this is a wonderful judgment. You can read it. It's got scientific references. It's got references to the uh, scientific literature. They've been assisted and phenomenal judgment. But in this judgment, where they interpreted Indian law, which had just been passed in 2004, the Supreme Court said this on the debating part. And I thought I should show this to you. He says the bill, that is the Patriots bill, evoked a highly insightful and informed debate on the subject. To anyone going through the debate on the bill, Parliament would appear keenly alive to national interests. When I read this, I was a bit surprised. Why don't they put this unless they felt that most of the time Parliament is not a very uh, uh, keenly alive to national interests? And here was a way in which the judges were, in some subtle sense, saying that here was an example where Parliament was doing something in the national interest and people were actually thinking. But eventually it turns out that this was uh, uh, very, very... In the last few days, because of the Ayodhya judgment, uh, you will find everybody quoted now the Sabri Malai judgment, all the judgments on temples which we have, uh, you will find this being quoted. B.R. Krishnaya was the man who said it in the Indian press first with an article, but he simply quoted an American judge in 1953 who said, we are not final because we are infallible, but we are infallible <coughs> only because we are final. And uh, you can think about this. So nobody is infallible uh, in these, but sometimes you don't have any other way. Today what is happening with science is this, that scientists are being looked at quite closely by government. And government is looked at by a general mass of politicians. And then there is the media which looks over everybody else. Yes. And even if there is no problem, the media will successfully create a problem, which we can then all spend the next two years uh, trying to solve. But uh, in America, science is not a very popular subject. And in India also, I don't think science is a very popular subject. So it is important to enhance the perception. But to communicate science, you need to be able to do this well. And it's difficult to find people who are able to communicate scientific findings <coughs> to a general public. And it is a difficult problem. But J.B.S. Holiday, who came and eventually died in India, a great friend of uh, P.C. Mahalmanis, he wrote an article a long time ago, which I like, which he says how to write a popular scientific article. He says literary synthesis is like organic chemical synthesis in which I train. He says the method to be adopted depends on the product required, the raw materials, and the apparatus available. As my brain is my apparatus and different from yours, my method will also differ from yours. So everybody when they are writing should really use their brains and their own <coughs> methods and try to convey in the best possible way a scientific finding. And one can read things like Holden to uh, get an idea of what people do. But in conclusion, I just want to show you one thing. I took an issue of science a couple of years ago and just went through it to say, look, here I am, a scientist, a retired scientist. I can't learn anything anymore at all. And uh, do I understand what comes in the journal of science? Now, it turns out in the journal of science or nature, you can barely read one paper in an issue. Most of it is ununderstandable, even to people who are more or less in the field. Most professors won't tell you this, but this is the fact. <laughs> you ask them, did they then give a seminar? No. No way. At that time, they will be too busy attending meetings in Delhi or something like that. But it is difficult because science has become tremendously specialized. And I just taken a couple of papers from this issue. Same issue. Here's a worldwide survey of neonicotinoids or nerve agents in honey. The paper here saying that if you put these pesticides, which are commonly used even in India, what happens is 
uh, they are called, they're called neonicotinoids, they affect the brain, they affect the brain of the honeybee. Now the honeybee is the pollinator. So once the honeybee has got this pesticide in, it's got all confused because it's affected, it's a damage. And once it's confused, it's no longer able to find its way back to the bee, to the hive. So it can't find, it's a social insect. And this communication, where these social insects fly away, go pick up pollen, go somewhere else, deposit it, and eventually go back to their home, is very important. Once that pollen instinct is lost, the bee is an individual and the bee will die. And once all the honeybees lose their way, there will be no pollinators. And once pollinators are not there, agriculture will be in trouble. So it's an important topic. Now, uh, many times the public that is all of us, only worry within the honey that we take, are they neonicotinoids which are going to affect us. But that's not enough. This also must be understood. And then only one can have a rational discussion on the use of pesticides. Here's another one. Microorganisms in the soil produce, they turn over all the carbonaceous materials in the soil. And they are the ones which many of them digest, difficult to digest things like the uh, lignocellulosic materials, lignin, and so on. They also produce carbon dioxide. So they contribute to the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But in order to do this, you need to do a study. In 1991, they started this study. They measured this all the way. And you can see that it grows, it goes down, goes up, and all. But this is because the microbial communities are now evolving in the soil. Because as the nutrients that they get change, the microbial communities change. So if you want to ask what is the soil contribution to atmospheric carbon dioxide, you have to do this experiment from 1991 all the way to 2016 or thereabouts. Now who will give you money? The government will ask you, what use is this? Has this now uh, influenced society today? It doesn't influence society today, but it will influence a rational decision on what to do uh, tomorrow with respect to soil contributions uh, to carbon dioxide. In fact, the entire climate change debate is based only on one graph, a graph which was begun in the 1950s, uh, in which one individual measured carbon dioxide from the beginning. He even lost his funding along the way. Because what is the use of measuring carbon dioxide? But today, hundreds of millions of dollars are spent having global conferences on climate change. Uh, so, and the same graph will be shown again and again. So the temperature variation and the carbon dioxide uh, correlation are shown there. They're in the same issue. You know, all in the same issue at the same time. It says the proton radius we visited. Now, do you really want to know the radius of the proton? You will say, no, I don't want to know the radius of the proton, or what use can it be? But you know, the physicists want to know the radius of the proton. And they will do very expensive and very sophisticated measurements to measure the radius of the proton. And they would like to measure the radius of the proton, and from that get the radio constant and other things to very, very high accuracy. Is this what they use? My, uh, I would say, we don't know. Because many other things that the physicists have done in the past didn't look like they were useful when they were doing it. And uh, eventually it turned out to have enormous applications uh, everywhere. So some of this kind of research needs to be supported, and it cannot be supported unless it is understood. So across the board, from things which tell you whether you're going to be poisoned by the honey that you have, to whether physicists can, they all appear in one journal. How do you communicate this to them? This is the communicating to an audience like yours, which is already sort of trained in science, is one thing. But communicating it to a more general audience is something which is very much more difficult. But now I come to the end, because I've taken quite some time. I don't know how many of you have seen this book. Just seen this book. And if you see this book, if you haven't seen this book, see it. You don't have to read all of it. I just glanced through it. The reason is this book is written by a historian, and a young Israeli historian. But when I read this book, the first thing that occurred to me was that this young Israeli historian had a better and more profound grasp of biology than all the biology professors whom I needed. And uh, 
The reason is he really talked about uh, many things and then tried to connect them. Now he really asks, this is a brief history of human. And of course this begins with origins of human. Begins with your ancestors. Maybe even begins with monkeys, but uh, begins a long time ago. Might even begin with the first cell which appeared on Earth. Doesn't matter. But he then says that how cultures and biology and history are connected in some way or the other. He actually asks this question, when does biology, when <coughs> is the course of human progress determined not by biology, but by cultural evolution? And this is a very important question, because for animals, the course of their life is determined by biology. We are also animals, so our life should also be determined by biology. And then he goes back in time, of course, to argue that when we were all hunter-gatherers, uh, we were animals. And uh, it is only after the evolution or the invention of agriculture did small groups of human beings begin to congregate in one place, begin to till the land, begin to form groups and begin to form societies. And he of course argues here that when you begin to form societies and you begin to have farms and so on, you will now need to protect these from predators. They may be animal predators and over a period of time there will also be other human predators which will be other societies which come along. And this is the beginning of human history. He then says that cognitive evolution is accordingly the point when history declared its independence from biology. And this is a wonderful statement. Cognitive evolution means we've begun to think. We've begun now to create what he calls the immense diversity of imagined realities. And uh, he is, of course, you can see from his writing, uh, a confirmed atheist. Uh, a determined believer in biology and science. He also says in his acknowledgments that his friends advised him to moderate many of the statements which were there in the original drafts of his book. And he also has relegated to footnotes some of the more contentious sentences which people might call out of context. But he then says, from the cognitive revolution onwards, historical narratives, reaches, biological theories, as a primary means of explaining the development of Homo sapiens. And he says, to understand the rise of Christianity or the French Revolution, it is not enough to comprehend the interaction of genes, hormones, and organisms. It is necessary to take into account the interactions of ideas, images, and fantasies as well. And this is what is the most important statement that one might make, because many things that we argue, fight, and uh, kill one another about are creations of the human mind. They are sometimes imagined realities, they are fantasies, they really sometimes have no strong scientific basis at the moment. This is because science today can go back and date artifacts all the way back to a very, very long period of time. And so the advances in the earth sciences, in isotope dating methods, and so on allow us to go back a very long period of time, long before human history began. And therefore, if you can think about uh, uh, dinosaurs today, you might as well worry about what human beings were doing uh, not 3,000 years ago. You might ask the question, what were they doing 15,000 years ago or 30,000 years ago? In the journal Science in 1969, 50 years ago, I found this editorial, a cry for reason half a century ago. And uh, here he, they say that for man's story in brief is essentially that of a creature who has abandoned the state and replaced it with cultural tradition and the hard-won increments of contemplative thought. The lessons of the past have been found to be a reasonably secure instruction for proceeding against the unknown future.
to hurl oneself recklessly without method upon a future that we ourselves have complicated is a sheer nihilistic rejection of all that history, including the classical world, can teach us. So I think one should be extremely careful in asking, in discussing events of the past and in actually uh, asking whether you really believe some things have evidence, uh, whether there's evidence based to believe. I also tell you that we have two dominant technologies. Certainly uh, in Karnataka, we were very proud of the fact that we were the first state to have a ministry which was devoted to information technology and biotechnology. But both of these have a common origin. They have a common origin in the 1940s, when Oswald Avery worked on DNA and found DNA as the transforming principle. And at the same time, Clark Shannon at MIT had actually written his PhD on an algebra for theoretic genetics. So the birth of information technology and biotechnology really happened with the roots in biological thinking at that time. And the information theory and biotechnology are not that far away. But in conclusion, and I've come to the end of my presentation, one must ask, what is the connection between science and society? Now, you can't do better than go to a cartoonist, and there's been no better commentator on the Indian condition than R.K. And many years ago, this was long back, uh, before India really began to be talking about the space program, uh, the space program had started, the space center was there, and Lachman wrote this cartoon. He imagined a time that the Indian Space Research Organization would be looking to put a man into the moon. And he says, this is our man, and there's Lachman's common man. He can survive without water, food, light, air, or shelter. And therefore, he is now the ideal astronaut to work in harsh, inhospitable so I must end by thanking you for inviting me to come and speak on a subject which is far removed uh, from anything uh, technical. And uh, I can only, I have only one acknowledgement, and that acknowledgement is to my own institution, which is I think an institution which all new institutions might do well to emulate. Uh, in that it has given me the freedom over four decades uh, to actually think about whatever I like, say whatever I like, write about whatever I like, without ever having uh, pulled me up at any point, and even done me the honor of raising me to the position of the head of the institution, despite everything that I have said over here. Thank you very much. politicians, judges, and the carbon man, science, and also he also has gone to very deep sense. I think you know, how the discoveries have taken place and what is the past history. It's a wonderful stuff we have. Uh, every one of us we have written that. I enjoyed it. I enjoy it. <laughs> and that one slide I think about science, engineering, and technology, the same Semester I got only that. From <laughs> 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 the first few students. Thank you very much, sir. We're happy to see you. You're you talking about science can never lead to technology. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I know that science is the basis. No, that's not science. Because you came from change. That's what I have been telling them. Okay. Of course, it's like the lake. We will help you questions. I think every one of us gets connected to some of our other people. The same way. Thank you. 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 Someone has to start. Yeah, Jay? I don't know what this is. Huh? I don't know what this is. Oh, yeah. You asked me what? I actually, if I can answer it. I can answer it. I can answer it. Sir, you mentioned about the discovery is a sort of uh, accident. So, I wanted an explanation for that. Because many of the, some of the I mean, kind of great discoveries, they also are connected to the, some sort of creators of great events. You know, accidents actually happen to creative people because uh, creative people are the ones who are actually thinking about things all the time. And either when they make an observation 
of in the natural of natural phenomena. Or when they make an observation of a laboratory phenomenon, this has happened in an experiment, they are able to now connect uh, to their thinking. Now, most of us, uh, you know, we are much more rooted to the immediate, and we are not thinking about uh, problems with water or so on. There are many problems in every discipline. Like in my own, there is many problems which are bothering people for a long time. But we don't have any idea of how to uh, make the next uh, advance. But there will be some creative people who keep thinking about it, and then they suddenly make the connection. That's a discovery. Invention is more purposeful. Invention is much more purposeful. Inventors are sometimes non discoverers and discoverers are not Although that's a bad thing. Ah, the, all the dreams and all. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, what? Actually, I don't know if you There's a lot of literature discussion on Kekwe's dream. Yeah. Of course, it's very hard now to go back 150 years and say, did you really have a dream? <laughs> you can ask. But in a way, I think it's. Uh, the dream story itself is a kind of story which tells you that you're thinking about something all the time. And so even when you're not getting sleep, you you may suddenly get a... Sometimes even the minor problem, we get a, a solution and we are worried. Yeah, on the dream, what the philosophy lies is science, technology, and uh, for all this part, where the philosophy is playing the role. Where does philosophy play a role? I can define actually what I can define what philosophy is. Now when one tries to understand the basis of uh, scientific discovery, uh, I'm not sure that you would call that uh, philosophy. Sometimes you're trying to understand how did things become the way they are. That's something that even historians uh, worry about. They don't know the connections between these. There are people I know who have conducted courses on the history and philosophy of science together. But I'm not one who can comment in an intelligent <laughs> In fact, I would say the PhD degree as the doctor of philosophy. Its historical origin was because the original scientists, by the general population around them, were classified as natural philosophers. Uh, In a way, philosophers are thinkers. Uh, and uh, the early scientists were all also thinkers. So they were in many ways thinking about the natural world. So I guess they were called natural philosophers. Today in the doctrine of philosophy, um, I don't think a single <laughs> recipient of the degree can ever say that we even remotely philosophical. No. <laughs> okay, sir. So now we mentioned that last part of the whole week you have seen in how the things could happen. No, last four decades I have seen that we have seen. So how do you think the what is the what do you think the curve is having a positive scope? Is it progressive or yeah you see curves are always or all curves are positive by and large with respect to institutions. Uh, because institutions do keep growing in many parameters which you measure as productivity, etc., they do keep it moving. In the, the public mandate is something that one needs to very carefully define. Now, if you look at the public mandate of educational institutions, is to impart the highest quality education to all the people who come into it. That is the public mandate. The public mandate of higher education institutions 
is not to solve every problem that confronts uh, the country. We have a whole range of specialist national laboratories which are there who have much more well-defined mandates. And one might ask the question, what is their mandate and are they performing their mandate? But say for example, if you take IITs, and uh, you are a young IIT here, uh, I had this argument when I was director with members of parliament, with uh, uh, businessmen and so on. They will, uh, the purpose of educational institutions is to educate people, to provide people who go everywhere. And very educated people will contribute to society in many, many different ways. Higher educational institutions are not the ones which are going to be developed as a products. Even when they have made a discovery which is going to eventually become a product, they are not the places where the product is to be developed, but the product must be developed somewhere else with the credit being given to the higher educational institution for development. If you expect higher educational institutions to do everything, they will do nothing. Right now what has happened is higher education institutions are taking shelter under the guise of doing everything and maybe paying less attention to educational aspects which research and teaching which is important for the students who are coming out. See, if you take my own institution, I studied at IIT Kanpur, and suppose you ask the question, what contribution has IIT Kanpur made to the country? It has produced a huge number of people who have done various things for the country. They have been wealth creators on the one hand. Huh? Uh, you can't do better than, say, Narayanmukhi or someone like that in creating wealth. Like this, there are so many people. There are people who have gone into the social sector. There are people who have gone into public service. There are people who have gone into academic institutions. So I think every institution eventually produces a lot of very good people who contribute. I don't subscribe to this view that uh, we are very aware uh, that nothing has been done for the last 70 years. You showed data about the perception of public and the scientists. You showed that they are making data. There is a huge yeah. gap. Yeah. There in America this problem is less important than in India. Largely because in America, although there is this big gap between public perception and this, the, the decisions on science uh, funding, etc., uh, which, which take place in Congress are actually done by congressmen who are big advocates of science. In India, we don't have anybody in the parliament who is an advocate of uh, uh, science, technology, higher education. We don't have anybody who is passionate about it. Uh, we have the danger here of going backwards because some decision or the other is taken uh, without quite understanding the need. See, if you have created a new institution now, this institution must grow. You do not have it not to grow. It doesn't do anybody any good. And if you have got a good institution, we must make sure it becomes better. We can't now, it's very easy for institutions to decay. <coughs> In India, we have had many examples of institutional decay which we have seen in front of our eyes. Especially if you are like me, who have been around for a long time and came very young. In, when I first came here, Delhi University, Madras University, Calcutta uh, University were the leading places for science in, uh, in India. Today, will anybody say that? So, we have done that. So we are very good at uh, making institutions decay. Sometimes we are good at even building them up. You know, I saw IIT Kanpur at, in, in its early days. It was as good as any American university. It had, what was it good at? Not the surroundings, not the hostels, not the uh, canteen, not the less, nothing. But the quality of the second. The quality of its faculty was amazing. They were energetic. Uh, that energy rubbed off for everybody. Uh, 
Today you don't see that, but today you see a certain tiredness. Uh, and I think this is going to be this constant uh, lack of understanding as to what is the mandate of an institution. See, education is a very important thing. I mean, if your students are educated, they study here mechanical engineering, but they may go tomorrow and uh, become, uh, do social service. I think still their education stands them in very good stead when they're doing that. They think logically, they think analytically, uh, they can handle many uh, problems. But I don't think we should worry about that. But we need education. Even if they study philosophy, they should know what the subject is all about. Uh, to think <clears throat> about uh, any problem in a creative way and become more curious to solve. Uh, I think this happens in an environment only by uh, uh, discussion. See, there are only some individuals uh, who are enthusiastic and energetic all the time. There may be a large number of people who get energized and enthused when someone else is there. Enthusiastic in the neighborhood. And if you have a sufficient number of people in an institution who are enthusiastic, that runs off on the uh, uh, on the people. So creating an environment. See, we have this great advantage, I would say, uh, at the uh, Indian Institute of Science. At the Indian Institute of Science, the great advantage is one is history, the other is tradition and the other is inertia. So if an institution has a very high inertia, even if it is good to decay also, it will have inertia. Good This way also it will go slowly, that way also it will go slowly. Better. Yeah, the curiosity, the curate of the problem was it with the car, the examples, the connectivity. All of us as teachers, when we go, automatically curiosity comes to the students. That is the best way. Sir, you also made one beautiful statement that you have to look at your Indian the future and uh, come and search for the past what has happened. Instead of saying in our country, everything whatever we say, oh, it has been already discovered thousand years ago, or ten thousand years ago. Even assuming, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Even if from grounds that yes, the first aeroplane flew in India 3,000 years ago. I agree. It's done. Huh? Does it today influence our present conditions? Maybe for those people who think that, what are we doing? We are then saying we are much better than uh, anybody in the West. That's what we are what implying. It's a sense of insecurity. I agree, we are much better than anybody in the West. But then you have to ask the question, are we today much better than anybody in the West? Uh, it doesn't matter. But if you were a historian, if you granted that, the question you have to ask is, if we did discover the first, uh, if we did invent and construct the first aeroplane, what happened afterwards? Where is the record? Why was it not multiplied? Why was that knowledge not? Now there is no point in saying that it has been lost because of all other people. Because blaming others uh, doesn't help you today. Yeah. It's like uh, children can't blame their parents after a point. Yeah. Uh, yeah, after a point. Very good. I think you know uh, scientific methods in India. How do I see growth of scientific knowledge? Yeah, in sometimes, sometimes I feel, I'm afraid, we are stuck in a red class of uh, publishing more papers. In the, in the see, one science. thing is that if you, I won't say that you should not publish. I think unless you publish, uh, nobody will know whether anything is being done or not. One of the problems that institutions face, and I was for a long time head of an institution, so one of the problems with the institutional case is somebody doesn't publish anything. It doesn't mean that person is deeply thinking about the problem. Because you, <laughs> <laughs> you have lost. And 
Actually, if you are a director like me, okay. you will go around quickly and find out, is that guy really doing something or not? You know the guy is not even coming to the uh, <laughs> institution. Maybe he's seen in the market. No. All of that you can find out. So, absence of uh, publications doesn't mean that the person is giving a great deal of At the same time, a profusion of publications also does not mean that that person is really uh, analyzing any problem in depth. But this can be, at least in a profusion of publications, you can read the publication and make some assessments. I think academicians should publish. Uh, how much they should publish is, of course, left to their judgment. But uh, say humanities and social sciences sometimes, I think we don't publish for a long time. And then they publish a book. Now, when they publish a book, it's a comprehensive uh, study. And therefore, that must be looked at uh, as a book and as the scholarly output of the, of the individual. But I, you know, generally, everybody would like, I haven't come across a scientist who doesn't want to be famous. Okay, because, uh, they would like to be famous, they would like to find something. Uh, at the end of a long career, you're usually disappointed that you have not really uh, found something uh, uh, extraordinary. But it's not given to everybody to find something extraordinary. We must all be working. I'll tell you something, a subject which I've spent a lot of time reading and also talking about. You take the field of psychometry. In the field of cytometrics, citations to a paper are important. This type of the paper is important. So now you can ask the question, can we have a world in which only papers which are very highly cited are published? This is not possible. And Eugene Garfield, who is the founding father of cytometrics, actually said that if you have many papers which have been cited, one, twice, these are what you would call mediocre papers. So he wrote an essay, at the end of the essay he says this. He says, long live the mediocrities, without them how could they be geniuses? <laughs> you might actually think about this. Well, the scientific literature is built on a large foundation. So I think even incremental results can be published, somebody will find them later. But what is published should be correct as far as possible. Genuine mistakes one can make, but facts are also important. Some people collect facts very well and they document them without uh, too much of, uh, but we can use them. Today in biology, I can tell you that there is more data documented in publicly available databases and anybody who's speaking can probably use those databases without needing to spend any money. Okay, so I think uh